Hello, my name is Dr. Brady Carter, um, and I am a senior scientist with Novacina. And today I'm going to be talking about how water activity measurement can help customers save millions and avoid recalls. Um, and so I'm going to be focusing on uh, the application of water activity uh, and the ways that it can be used to help with product safety and quality, as well as talking about what water activity is. So what are some things that, uh, that you should know about water activity? Um, first of all, we're going to talk about what water activity is. Um, and in so doing, we're going to talk about some of the myths about water activity, and we're going to correctly define water activity. And then we're going to talk about how it's different from moisture content. We'll talk about how we measure it. And then we'll talk about what does this value mean in terms of um, meeting government regulations and maintaining product safety and quality, avoiding waste, all of those things that uh, will help uh, customers be able to make products that are uh, not going to be subject to recalls and are going to be delivered uh, to, their, uh, to their customers in the form that they intend. So to start, let's talk a little bit about water since uh, we're talking about water activity. Um, before we define water activity, we need to know a little bit of, uh, about water and, and some unique properties that water has. Um, water is a fairly simple molecule. Um, two hydrogens is bonded to an oxygen. Uh, but it's the nature of those bonds and how they uh, interact with other water molecules and how they interact with um, other uh, materials and molecules that are inside of a food product or any kind of product. Um, the water molecule uh, has a unique capability to be able to uh, hydrogen bond three-dimensionally. Um, and it, in fact, will form a tetrahedral shape with the other molecules, water molecules uh, that it bonds with. Um, so that it can have interactions, hydrogen bonding, uh, in ev basically every direction around the water molecule, as shown in the image. Um, so you have oxygen at the center. Uh, at the There's um, a net negative charge on that oxygen because it preferentially takes electrons away from the hydrogen. So it has a net negative charge, and the hydrogen molecules on, that, on the water molecule will have a positive charge. Um, that means that they're polar. Uh, which means that as a polar molecule, water wants to interact with other polar molecules, including other water molecules. Um, and so wherever, uh, if you have uh, water sitting in front of you, uh, wherever there's a water molecule in contact with other water molecules, the oxygen portion of the water molecule will interact with two hydrogens, um, and the hydrogens, each of the hydrogens will interact with an oxygen. Um, and that's what forms this tetrahedral shape, and that's called hydrogen bonding. Um, and it can also interact in other types of uh, ways with other molecules uh, uh, that are not water, such as through ionic bonds, dipole-dipole um, interactions, and uh, van der Waal interactions. Uh, and so because of this capability of water being a polar molecule to interact with, uh, with other materials, um, makes it very important as a solvent, um, makes it very important as just a general ingredient uh, in a product. And here on Earth, we can find water in all of its forms, and we find it everywhere. It's, it's uh, ubiquitous. Now, in order to fully understand what that wa those water molecules are doing, um, we need to know something about the energy uh, state of the water molecules that are present. Um, we call that chemical potential energy. So every uh, molecule uh, is going to have a certain amount of chemical potential energy associated with it. And this has to do with uh, the energies that's stored in the bonds themselves. So the, the bond between oxygen and uh, it's two hydrogens in a water molecule, there is a certain amount of chemical potential energy that's stored within those interactions or bonds. And when 
water interacts with something else because of its polar nature and undergoes some type of a bonding, hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, with uh, those other materials, there is a transfer of some of that energy that's stored within the bonds of a water molecule into the interactions that are occurring between water and, and other molecules. Um, so that the energy, the net energy or chemical potential energy of the water molecule is altered or changed as a consequence of some of that energy being transferred into those interactions. And that's conservation of energy, which goes back to uh, the, the fundamental laws of thermodynamics. And from those fundamental laws of thermodynamics, we can derive an equation that helps us define the chemical potential energy of any kind of a species. Uh, in this case, we're talking about water. So uh, from that, uh, those fundamental uh, thermodynamics, we derive what's called Gibbs free energy equation. Um, and that's the equation that's shown here. Uh, in this equation, what we see is that the chemical potential energy of a species, in this case water, is going to be equal to what its uh, chemical potential energy is of the pure substance. So when it's not, it's just water, um, and we're not seeing any kind of interactions going on with other molecules, what is that chemical potential energy? Um, and so that's going to be a defined value um, that's specific to the species, in this case water. And then we have the rest of the, de uh, the equation that has the gas constant multiplied by temperature and then multiplied by the natural log of what we're calling fugacity, this, or relative fugacity. It's the F over F naught in, uh, in this equation. Um, so if we take a look at that equation, the chemical potential energy of the pure substance, as I said, is defined by the species. So that's a constant. Um, the gas constant, of course, is a constant. If we control temperature and don't allow it to change, that becomes a constant. Um, and so under that scenario, the only way that uh, the chemical potential energy of water would change is if there was a change in this relative fugacity. Um, and it ends up that fugacity uh, is just a term for uh, the escaping tendency or escaping ability of a material, in this case, water. So that uh, fugacity term um, can also be referred to as an activity. Uh, and so in a sense, this, this F over F naught, we could uh, put in replace of that in our equation, water activity. Um, and so that tells us that water activity is directly proportional to the chemical potential energy of water. And that we determine or we can uh, ascertain what that energy level is by looking at the escaping tendency of water molecules. The more energy, chemical potential energy, a water molecule has, the, the more uh, probability there is that that will be translated into kinetic energy and allow for that water molecule to escape, to have enough kinetic energy to escape into the vapor phase. Um, and so that's the way that we are able to determine what that chemical potential energy is of water is by looking at how readily does do those water molecules escape uh, into the vapor phase. Um, and we see that if the, the relative or the water activity of, uh, it, of a material, if that water activity were one, where those two relative fugacities were the same value, um, and that would be the case if you were dealing with pure water. So if uh, the water activity of pure water is one, if we plug one into this equation, the natural log of one is zero. So we lose the back part of our equation and the chemical potential energy of water becomes equal to that of the, uh, the chemical potential energy of the pure substance. Um, so we know that the equation works. Now in, in practical terms, um, the way that we determine that relative fugacity that we called an activity, or in this case, water activity, the way that we determine that uh, is by looking at uh, vapor pressures. Uh, and so the way that we uh, measure water activity is by looking or measuring the partial pressure above, uh, of water above a sample or the vapor pressure of water above that sample. Um, when it's in, when it's sealed in a chamber and it's at a state of equilibrium, divided by 
the saturated vapor pressure or the vapor pressure of pure water at that same temperature. And if those two values are the same, then it's that the water activity is one. So that's the water activity, as we said earlier, of pure water. Um, as that vapor pressure, that partial pressure over the sample decreases and, and reduces, then you'll see a reduction in water activity and, and theoretically it could go all the way to zero if there were no water molecules and no vapor pressure uh, within the headspace. That's not achievable uh, here on planet Earth because water, as I said earlier, is everywhere, but um, theoretically that's what it would be. And so from all of this and, and by defining water activity as being equal and, and the way that we measure it is by partial pressure, then really what we're, we've defined is that a measurement of water activity is actually a measurement of the energy status of water. And so that's the correct definition. You'll notice that at no time in defining water activity or in this discussion have I used the terms free or bound or available. Um, water activity is not the free water. Um, it gets, that definition gets used with it all the time, but it can be quite confusing. There is no scientific definition for free and bound. Um, and so it's more correct, and the, and the definition that we utilize is that water activity is a measure of the energy status of water in a system. Uh, it's chemical potential energy uh, for as an averaging of all the water molecules within a system. What is that uh, average chemical potential energy of the water? And that's important because thermodynamics, as we know, dictate whether things happen uh, spontaneously in an energetically favorable way. And so what that water activity is, that energy of water is now gonna have an impact on all kinds of things that are gonna happen in the product uh, because of that, that uh, relevance in terms of energy and transfer of energy. Water activity is also, uh, could be called equilibrium relative humidity because relative humidity that we measure of the air, a term that we use with, with conditions in the, in the air or the atmosphere, um, what we measure in the case of relative humidity is the relative vapor pressure uh, in that air compared to the saturated vapor pressure, the point at which it can no longer hold water molecules and water will condense out. Um, and so it's basically a measure of how close you are to saturation. Uh, that's the same measurement as water activity. So relative humidity and water activity are related. Um, they're the same thing when you're in a state of equilibrium. So equilibrium relative humidity, so the relative humidity that would be inside of a sealed chamber would be the same thing as water activity. So how do we measure water activity then? So the, the process is to take some type of a food or a material, put it inside of a sealed chamber, and, in, and then allow water molecules to escape into the vapor phase. The number of water molecules and the pressure that it exerts will be dictated by the average chemical potential energy of water in that product. Uh, and so we'll achieve a certain vapor pressure. And when we talk about equilibrium, what we're talking about is a steady state. So water molecules are in a constant state of flux. Their energy is changing all the time depending on what they're doing and, and what, how they're interacting with other molecules. But uh, equilibrium means that there's no change over time. And so you can reach a condition where uh, the number of water molecules in the vapor state isn't changing. Every time one comes up, one goes back down in. So there's no net change over time. That's what we define as equilibrium. So when we've reached those conditions of equilibrium, if we take a measurement of that vapor pressure, that partial pressure, and then we divide that by what the pressure would be if we took water and put it in a, a cup at the same temperature, and there'll be a certain number of water molecules that have energy to escape in the vapor phase. And that number is actually completely dependent upon temperature. So if we know the temperature, we can immediately know the saturated vapor pressure. So with those two values, we can uh, combine them together and we get water activity. So what are some of the factors that uh, affect that energy level? And we can, uh, we can basically classify them in, in three different types of effects. Those are colligative effects or solute interactions, matrix effects or surface interactions, or capillary effects. Um, in the case of food and manufactured products, the most important of these interactions are 
the matrix effects or surface interactions. And that's the, the, the interactions that we would normally think of, like water interacting with sugar, water interacting with salt, um, things that are polar that are causing there again to be a transfer of chemical potential energy from the water molecules into those types of interactions. And it's a, a combination of these factors uh, that actually overall determine what that energy is. But again, the most important will be the matrix effects. The uh, water activity um, is not the same thing as moisture content. The moisture content is the quantitative amount of water that uh, is present in a material, whereas the water activity is a qualitative measure of the energy of the water. So moisture content uh, is basically how much water is present, whereas water activity is what is the energy of that water. Now they do, they are related to each other as you increase the amount of water molecules that are present, then you will have a, also an increase in the, the overall energy of those water molecules. So they, they are related, but they are not the same thing. Um, moisture content tells us how much water is present. It doesn't tell us anything about what that water is doing, how it's interacting, or how it's impacting things that are happening within the product from an energy standpoint. That all comes from water activity. So in, in most cases, water activity becomes the more important measurement, and moisture content serves the purpose as a standard of identity. Uh, to, for the product of how much uh, of that product is water versus other materials or ingredients. And so the way that we measure moisture content is, uh, again, it's a quantitative measurement. So we basically measure uh, in some way uh, from a quantitative standpoint, a amount of water, and then compare that to the total of uh, weight of the product um, and from that we get a percentage. So moisture content is typically reported as a percentage of water in comparison to whatever else is there or all the other materials that are there. And so the, the primary way of measuring that is through what's called a loss on drying. And this is where you basically take, measure a wet weight or weight of the product as is. And then you take that product and subject it to elevated temperatures, uh, driving out the water, and then you measure it again. And the difference in the weights will, will be water, uh, theoretically. And then you divide that either by the dry weight or the wet weight, depending on what type of ha uh, reporting method you're using. Um, so there are some problems that can be associated with that approach, though. Um, and that is mainly that when you elevate the temperature of a, of a product, uh, you drive things out that are volatile, anything that's volatile at that temperature, which is not just water. And so you're actually losing weight by the, the loss of things other than just water. Um, but you, they have no way of differentiating between what's water and what's other uh, volatiles that are being uh, removed. And so we use the term moisture content specifically for a reason, which is that it's defined as pretty much everything or anything that uh, uh, leaves the product at elevated temperatures um, because of it, it's really not possible to overcome that. In addition, the temperature at which you heat the product will also impact what the moisture content is. And, um, and so if you, you, you heat it to 100 degrees versus 120, those are two different answers. Um, and the real problem with moisture content is that we really don't have a way of knowing what the true value is because of uh, these challenges that are associated with the measurement approach, as well as the fact that there is no standard uh, for moisture content. Um, we don't have an, uh, an uh, external standard that we know the moisture content of that product without having measured it. Um, we have that for water activity in the form of salt standards um, that are uh, of known water activity, but we don't have that in moisture content, and it makes it really challenging. Um, because of that tendency to have problems with the loss on drying approach, uh, there are alternative methods such as titration, uh, where you, uh, you do a chemical reaction that involves water. Um, the idea there being that then you would only detect water <clears throat> um, as it uh, is lost. 
or as, as you have the interaction uh, or the reaction occur, it would only, um, you would only see water and you do that through a titration process. And this is most commonly called Carl Fisher. Um, but there are problems associated with this as well. If you don't have the right solvents, uh, you can get incorrect answers um, and it can be challenging. You have to have some training in order to be able to do it correctly. So, so there's some challenges associated with moisture content. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that, that a lot of people some uh, mistakenly uh, use moisture content as a way of determining safety um, uh, of a product and when in reality it's not uh, related to safety or uh, in a lot of cases quality, whereas water activity is related and is the, uh, the more correct measurement to use. As I said uh, before, water activity and moisture content are related to each other and they're related through something called the moisture absorption isotherm. This is an absorption profile uh, for a product. So as water activity increases, there is a subsequent change in moisture content and vice versa. Um, but that's very unique to each type of product, as you can see shown in this uh, graph. Um, each of those products have a very unique isotherm shape. And so it's not a, a general relationship uh, across all types of materials. It's very specific to the material um, and essentially has to be measured uh, for that material to know what that relationship is. <clears throat> Now, in terms of, of measuring water activity, uh, one of the, the crucial aspects of, of measuring it, um, as I indicated earlier, is, is achieving vapor equilibrium. Um, in order to be able to determine the vapor pressure, which is again related to the energy of the water, uh, we have to be able to achieve a state of equilibrium, as, at least as close as we can. Um, and equilibrium takes time, um, takes time for those water molecules to escape in the vapor phase. And the amount of time that it takes is very dependent on the sample material that's being run um, and, and less dependent on the instrumentation that's being used. So the, the, water, the test time for water activity is more uh, dictated by the sample than it is by the instrument. Um, and so when you think about the question of uh, wh how long will a water activity test take, uh, you have to, it's not a, a simple answer where we can give one time and say water activity takes less than five minutes um, because it's fully dependent on the material that you're reading um, and how long vapor equilibrium takes for that particular material. Um, and if you don't, if you prematurely take a measurement <clears throat> before you've achieved true vapor equilibrium, then obviously your water activity values that you measure could be incorrect. And so it's really important when thinking about water activity um, that the, the first thing um, that you think about is shouldn't be just how fast can I do it. It should be, am I achieving true vapor equilibrium so I'm getting accurate results. So some facts about test time. Again, as I said, water activity, we can't just generally say it's not a five minute or less test um, or a claim that you can do uh, water activity in five minutes or less <clears throat> because that's very dependent on the sample and it won't be true for all sample types. In fact, it's, it's really only true for very specific salt standards that you can use to check the instrument. Um, and it certainly cannot be measured in one minute. Any, any um, instrumentation that claims to be able to do water activity in a minute or less <clears throat> is using a prediction, predicting based upon how um, the equilibration process is uh, progressing and then making an extrapolation as to what it will be in the, uh, when it finally reaches equilibrium. And so obviously that's a predicted and not a true value. Um, and certainly not a value that you should ever use for meeting um, regulations or uh, for release of product uh, because you're setting yourself up for possibly having a wrong value for water activity, in which case you could release product that then is subject to a, a uh, <clears throat> recall because you were basing that um, release off of incorrect water activity values. And so because of that risk of uh, being of having the potential for recalls um, where you would what could cost millions and millions of dollars just by trying to get a really fast water activity value, um, it's much better to make sure that you've achieved true vapor equilibrium. 
Um, and all instruments rely on that vapor equilibrium. It's just a matter of how they're deciding when to decide that vapor equilibrium has been achieved and report that value. Um, and, and again, that will vary by product. Um, an instrument can't artificially speed up that equilibration process. So in reality, a specific type of product should take the same amount of time to run uh, in any given instrument if you're uh, running those tests in similar types of conditions. <clears throat> so, for example, if we have uh, shown here two different products, and let's say this product one has lots of salt and sugar and starch in it, um, and those are the main ingredients, water molecules can escape from that type of a product fairly quickly um, because they're, they're uh, moving through polar materials um, they don't have anything that's going to interrupt that. But then you use something, you have a different product, and that product has uh, lots of fat, let's say, and oil, or there's a hard surface, or it's crystalline. Um, in those types of products, it's much harder for water molecules to escape in the vapor phase because they have to move past um, portions of that product that, that it doesn't want, where it doesn't want to be. Um, it doesn't want to interact with <clears throat> materials that are hydrophobic. And so it takes longer for water molecules to move through that product. Thus, the test time on that particular product is going to be extended. <clears throat> so whereas one product may take 10 minutes to run, another product may take 25 or 30 minutes to run. Um, it's just the nature of water activity testing. How you determine the end of the test then becomes incredibly important. Um, vapor equilibration is the only way we can detect that is by a slowing of the rate of water activity change, <clears throat> um, indicating that you've achieved a steady state. The target rate of change that you use um, will determine and have an impact on the test time and accuracy. So if you, uh, if you set low stringency requirements for end of test, such as that you only have to achieve a difference in water activity, let's say, of 0005 one time, um, that, that's not all that difficult to do. And so you have a, there's a higher chance that you're going to achieve that kind of difference at a, in a faster amount of time, but doesn't truly indicate vapor equilibrium. It's just that you happen to have that difference. Versus if you had a setting where you, <clears throat> couldn't have a difference greater than 001 over a span of, say, six minutes. That's a much more stringent requirement to uh, show that you've achieved vapor equilibrium. As a consequence, uh, you're going to, that test time is going to be extended, but it's going to be much more accurate. You have a much more, uh, greater likelihood that you've achieved the true <clears throat> equilibrium for that, uh, for that particular product and that you're not going to be reporting incorrect water activities. Um, this impact of uh, end of test settings um, th that it can have on the results of a water activity test <clears throat> are, um, can cause so many problems that in the ISO 18787 official water activity method, it actually dictates what the end of test settings are going to have to be or should be uh, when you run a water activity test. And so it requires that you have a, um, that you have no greater di difference in water activity than 0003 for three measurements or over a span of one minute. And so if you use that setting versus in a lot of cases, the default setting for an instrument, it's going to have a different test time and you might even get a different result because you're using more stringent requirements for end of test. So it, it's another way to um, artificially <coughs> um, decrease the test time in order to, to appease uh, the desire by everybody to have very fast test times is to make that end of test requirement less uh, stringent, in which case you will get a faster reading. But the consequence could be that you also get an e an uh, incorrect reading because you haven't achieved true vapor equilibrium at what cost uh, is the what's the cost of then having that fast reading when you report an incorrect value and it could cause uh, a result in having to do a recall of a product 
because you released off of an incorrect water activity. So um, what we see is that in a lot of cases, if you use less stringent end of test uh, settings, you can see a difference in water activity as high as 0.2. So that could mean the difference between, say, a, point, a reading of 0.69 and a reading of 0.71. Um, which moves you above the practical limit for mold growth. Um, so is it really worth having as fast uh, test time by having less stringent reading uh, requirements to end the test? Um, so we, we see that uh, if, you, if you set, for instance, the, the end of test requirements to less stringent, um, that you certainly have uh, results that are um, that you get faster, but in all cases, or in most cases, we do see differences uh, if you set it to a more stringent requirement. Um, so, from this, what we can ascertain is that fast and accurate are, in a lot most cases, mutually exclusive. <clears throat> you can't you can't have both. Um, we can certainly do things to optimize test time, but uh, in most cases, trying to make it uh, faster than it should be, just results in incorrect readings. Now, in terms of water activity measurement, um, there are multiple ways that you can measure water activity. Um, some of these uh, methodologies are outdated at this point, um, such as hair hygrometers, freezing point depression, isopistic equilibration are all were previously used, but not uh, highly used anymore because they take a high amount of time to run. So um, now we have electric hygrometers and we have ch uh, chilled uh, mirror dew point uh, approaches for water activity that are most common used. In terms of um, sensors, the sensor that's used by Novacina um, is called the electrolytic sensor or electrolytic resistive sensor. Um, and the reason that, that Novacina utilizes this sensor uh, is because it's very stable. Um, it it's, has very low maintenance requirements, and that's one of its big advantages. Um, over, say, a chilled mirror approach where the mirror is contaminated, it can cause you to have incorrect readings. Um, we can achieve with this type of a sensor the highest level of accuracy um, at zero, plus or minus 0 0.003. Um, we can also use filters in combination with this sensor uh, which makes it possible to read things with volatiles, um, whereas with the chilled mirror approach, those volatiles can interact with the mirror and, and cause it to give incorrect readings. And it, it's just not possible to read them with a, with a chilled mirror, but we can with an electrolytic sensor um, when we utilize filters to block those volatiles. Um, and it can also measure the entire water activity range. Um, disadvantages is uh, that uh, we, it does show us sometimes slower, um, but in most cases that's because we, uh, with the electrolytic sensor and the approach that Novacina has, uh, we, um, we allow the, the user to set the stringency of the end of test uh, requirements and, and our default is to a more stringent requirement than you would see in a chilled mirror instrument. And so then a, a lot of times it takes longer, but you're actually achieving true vapor equilibrium um, with those longer test times. In terms of getting accurate measurements, the uh, important things uh, for water activity is the verification standards. Um, these are it, in two forms. Uh, one is a saturated salt slurry. Um, these standards, the advantage is that they're reusable for up to three years or even longer if they're stored correctly. Um, and so you don't have to keep buying them um, again and again, but they do take a little bit longer to read. Um, they can, uh, reading one of those standards can be up to 20 to 30 minutes, whereas unsaturated salt solutions are a one-time use, so they're a consumable, and that can add up to a, a fair amount of money, but they do run faster. They run in about three to four minutes, <clears throat> as opposed to the 20 to 30 minutes that it takes for a saturated slurry. And so there is um, a, an advantage to using those unsaturated salt solutions if you need to have those test results in a very short amount of time when you're trying to run a verification or calibration. But both will tell you whether the instrument's reading correctly. They are both have known water activities based upon either what salt's being used or what concentration 
in an unsaturated salt solution. And, and that's known independently. The other thing that can impact your accuracy is temperature. Uh, water activity is temperature dependent. It should always be reported with a temperature. Um, and as you change the temperature, so will the water activity change. And so it's really important that you, uh, that you both report the temperature, but also control the temperature. Um, and then sample preparation is also really important um, that you keep getting consistent results. And, and there it, uh, in lies the key is that just to be consistent in, when it comes to sample preparation, that you're using the same approach every time, um, <clears throat> whether that's grinding or whether that's crushing or cutting, um, that you're, you're being consistent in how you uh, prepare your sample. And the, that you avoid or prevent exposure of the sample to the room. Um, because again, relative humidity, water activity related to each other. A product with a low water activity, say 0.3, in a room that has 50% relative humidity, if it's exposed, uh, it will take up moisture um, until its water activity matches that of the relative humidity of the room. So any amount of time that your product's exposed to the ambient relative humidity, its water activity is changing. So it's important to try and prevent that by using some sort of a container um, the sample cups that uh, are used with water activity instruments work as a very temporary storage, um, but uh, are not to be used as long-term storage options. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, water activity and um, situations where it's been utilized uh, for savings, for preventing recalls or or it not it not being used uh, actually resulted in recalls and, and problems. So these are case studies from several different companies. <clears throat> uh, where water activity was critical and a, and a key component of um, being able to solve some problems. So our first one uh, is a nutraceutical powder company and they were having caking problems with their product, and we'll talk about how water activity helped with that. Then we'll talk about um, a bakery manufacturer and uh, where they had some rancid, or some baked snacks that went rancid and how water activity helped with that. And then we'll talk about a pet food company where uh, they had moldy pet food and how water activity helped with that. Um, and then uh, if time allows, we'll talk about some uh, a food manufacturer. So case one uh, of our case studies, we have a, um, a cake nutritional powder. Um, so what was happening here is that this powder was um, like an instant powder where you would add it to uh, milk or to uh, water and uh, mix it up. And then it's supposed to make a, um, a shake or a, a drink. Um, where you're able to get the beneficial effects of the powder. Um, the problem they were seeing was that they would um, manu they would package, manufacture and package this powder uh, and then ship it off to the customer. Um, but by the time it showed up to the, the consumer, um, it had started to cake and clump inside of the container. And as a consequence, it had lost its uh, its instant properties. So when you tried to put it into a solution and make it into a drink, uh, it, um, it wouldn't go into solution. It was, you were having big um, clumps um, within, the, uh, <clears throat> within the powder. And when you try to mix it, they wouldn't mix in. And so the consumers were unhappy and, and were basically um, asking for refunds uh, for the product because it wasn't performing the way that it was supposed to. So as a consequence of this, they were, um, they were seeing uh, product recalls and, and were having to refund money and it was costing them a lot of money um, as a consequence of uh, this caking. Whereas they put the product in um, the container, it was free flowing, but it was showing up cake. So why did this product start caking? Um, most likely it's because it got wet um, and, and it, somehow that was absorbing moisture and uh, from some source. 
Um, why did it getting wet or taking up moisture, why did that cause it to cake? And most likely it was because it, it caused it to experience a glass transition. Why did this glass transition occur? Um, most likely because the water activity increased as a consequence of a, a taking up moisture until it moved past a critical water activity, which is the water activity at which the glass transition occurs. Why did this water activity increase? Um, most likely because it was subjected to high humidity and there was some sort of a uh, failure in the packaging um, that resulted in that water activity going above that glass transition point. So in, in doing some investigations, um, we used what's called a dynamic isotherm to identify what's called the critical water activity. So what you see here is a free flowing product subjected to increasing levels of moisture, <clears throat> which then causes it to increase water activity. At a certain point at the critical water activity, you see what's called a glass transition, which causes there to be increased mobility within the product as well as um, increased availability of water binding sites. That's why there's a sharp inflection in this isotherm curve. Um, so where that inflection point is, is what we call the critical water activity. So as long as you would kept the water activity of this powder less than that critical value, it would stay free flowing. But if it moved above that critical value, it would start to cake and clump. So that now becomes the most important aspect of this product is keeping its water activity below that critical water activity. <clears throat> So how do we do that? Well, the, the main thing is that uh, packaging is one of its main purposes is to be a moisture barrier, to prevent the product from taking up water even when it's subjected to relative humidities that are higher than uh, the critical water activity. So in this case, it would only happen if the critical or if the relative humidity were above say 0.43 or 43%. But as long as that's the case, and certainly it would encounter those kinds of conditions, and, um, uh, in most of the locations that it would go to. Um, some locations, like in the west during the, the winter, where there's very low relative humidity in the western part of, of um, or in the, the drier parts of the, of the world, there, there may be um, water, relative humidities that are lower than that 0.43, in which case they, they most likely wouldn't have problems. But um, in other parts of the world where there's high humidity, uh, sending your product to that uh, to that location with high humidity. If the packaging isn't uh, behaving as a uh, a moisture barrier, then certainly you would have problems. But by replacing that um, moist or that packaging with a better moisture barrier, what the result would be is that it may take up some moisture and increase its water activity, but it would never get past that critical water activity. In which case, it would still remain free flowing, even though it had been exposed to very high humidity conditions. Um, so tracking changes in packaging, um, we do that through what's called Fickian uh, diffusion. Uh, and we can model actually what happens with the product based upon its moisture barrier properties. Or we can alternatively actually measure the moisture barrier properties of a packaging um, to see what those values are. But Ultimately, what we needed to do here is find out what was the moisture barrier properties um, and performance of their current packaging um, and whether that was having problems allowing <clears throat> the water to uh, infiltrate the packaging and replace that with a better packaging um, that had better moisture barrier properties and was preventing that from happening. <clears throat> Now, in most cases, when you go to a better moisture barrier packaging, you also increase the cost. Um, so you really don't want to do that as just a, a go-to re response or solution um, because it could come with added costs. Um, so you want to make sure it's the, the right packaging that's going to prevent that from happening, but not over package where you could then have waste um, that could cost in, uh, additional um, millions of dollars um, by trying to respond to a problem uh, and that response is, is not measured, it's over, an over response and as a consequence you're still costing the company money. So you know, the Six Sigma recommendations, if we were doing this as a, um, uh, as a, 
a determination of what was actually a root cause analysis for what caused the problems for this particular company. Uh, the recommendations out of that investigation would be to determine the critical water activity um, for each of these new products um, at room temp, both at room temperature and abuse temperatures. Because the other thing that could drive this is temperature. If <clears throat> you have a good mo moisture barrier, but uh, you increase the temperature and you have temperature abuse, what temperature abuse will do is drive the critical water activity to a lower value. In which case the packaging's performing, it's just that you've changed the critical water activity through temperature and now your water activity of your product as it was processed, whereas at low temperature it was fine, at high temperature it's now on the wrong side of that critical water activity and you have caking and clumping. Um, the next thing would also be to set a process specification that it's, that's based on water activity and make sure that the product is after processing is at a water activity less than the critical water activity and then use packaging um, and modeling to determine what's the uh, ideal packaging that will prevent that water activity from moving above a critical value um, and is at the lowest cost possible. Uh, our second case <clears throat> that we uh, were looking at is a uh, baking uh, company making a baked snack that um, they process uh, at their facility and then it's showing up to a consumer after it's shipped and stored, um, showing up to the consumer with uh, rancidity. And rancidity is, is, uh, results from lipid oxidation and is um, characterized by off flavors and off odors <clears throat> and uh, basically deems the product um, undesirable to a consumer, which then ends its shelf life. So in this case, because it was, and in fact, it was, it was showing up not at the consumer, but at a, a co-packing uh, location, and they were complaining back to the manufacturer that these had already turned rancid. They couldn't put them in um, the product or the, the final product they were making because they were already bad. And so they were being rejected, which of course was costing them millions of dollars. Um, <clears throat> so through investigations, what we found was that, uh, they were setting <clears throat> their moisture, they were determining their, uh, their release of product based on moisture content and not based on water activity. And their idea was that to keep pushing that moisture content specification to a lower value. And uh, as they did that, they were actually seeing bigger problems, more rancidity, and they couldn't understand why that would be the case. The thought was, if we reduce the amount of moisture in there, it should make the product last longer. Um, <clears throat> so they were, they tried as a response, what if we'll just up the moisture um, and started releasing off of it at 7.5, and all of a sudden they were having good product, and they really couldn't figure out why that was the case, that it was counterintuitive that increasing the moisture would somehow make this product more stable and, and uh, fix the problems it was having. The reason why that was uh, happening but not making sense was because uh, of their using moisture content and not having an understanding of what was going on with the water activity. So if we do our root cause analysis, um, why is the product being rejected? Uh, because it's become rancid. Why is rancidity occurring if the product has low moisture? Um, and this is where they were missing uh, the, the critical part was that rancidity actually increases at low moisture, at low water activities. Um, why, does it in, <clears throat> why does rancidity increase at low moisture? And it, it's because of the lack of hydration spheres at low water activity um, that those hydration spheres um, typically will slow rancidity, but when they're gone, um, rancidity will actually increase, so it increases at very low water activity. So why isn't the moisture spec working? Um, and that's because rancidity is driven by water activity. So uh, lipid oxidation, um, which lipid oxidation doesn't always mean rancidity, but they certainly have to have oxidation in order to get rancidity. Um, but lipid oxidation is an interesting reaction in terms of its relationship to water activity. Most reactions will increase as water activity increases and decreases, or decrease as water activity decreases. Um, but lipid oxidation is unique in that it starts to 
increase its rate of reaction at very low water activities as I indicated earlier. And that again is because the, the lack of hydration spheres that uh, are around the metal ions, these metal ions are needed um, <clears throat> in order to form free radical uh, lipids, um, lipid free radicals, which are necessary in order for oxidation to occur. Um, at a, in addition, at low water activity, these free radicals, uh, lipid free radicals are less likely to be quenched, um, as well as oxygen diffusion actually is higher at very low water activities. And that's why it increases as you get to very low. So there is a minimum point, um, a water activity at which that oxidation will be at a minimum. If you go lower than that, you're gonna have problems. If you go higher than that, you're gonna have problems. So it's an extra, there's an ideal water activity point or range uh, where you can um, uh, reduce that uh, oxidation rate uh, so that the product will remain stable. So if we, we graph that, what we see is that below um, 0.3 water activity, uh, that's that rate of rancidity or oxidation starts to increase to where it becomes unacceptable. Where, and on the other side, above 0.6, the same thing can happen again because the rate's increasing um, for different reasons, but <clears throat> is increasing as water activity goes up. So for this particular product, the target is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.6. <clears throat> which is where that minimum point was on the previous graph. And so the solution here is uh, rather than having a spec based on moisture content uh, is that you then adjust that to be a spec based on water activity and it's uh, make sure that it's between 0.3 and 0.6. You maximize the moisture level, which is weight, um, but you prevent any kind of problems. Um, and so now you, you, you're sending product out at 8% moisture, whereas before you were sending it out at 4%, which is just lost weight, but, but more importantly, it was actually not safe. It was going rancid. So by now adjusting and having this new spec, um, then you, you prevent the problem um, where you are basing things off of, of moisture content and instead basing them on water activity. So the Six Sigma recommendations in this case were to adjust the specification to 0.45 water activity um, and, and release off of water activity and maximize in the con uh, as a consequence your moisture without having problems. Um, so shift to releasing based on water activity instead of moisture content. Um, and this is because of potential errors in moisture content measurement um, uh, because, and, and so you don't want to, what was important for this company was for them to not think that they could just switch to a moisture content and just go to what value is associated with water activity because of the the possibilities of having in, of incorrect moisture content, which could then still lead to problems. Whereas it, by having the water activity in that critical range um, or in that ideal range that was identified, you make sure that you're never going to have any problems while maximizing your moisture content. For our final case, um, here we have uh, a, a company that, that makes uh, pet food, <clears throat> so hard kibble pet food. Um, they've been releasing their product on a 10% moisture content specification. Um, been doing it for 20 years, never had a problem. Um, and their product was well-liked, uh, well-received. Then all of a sudden they, uh, out of kind of nowhere, they, uh, had product recalls that um, product was showing up moldy to consumers. There was concern about mycotoxins. Um, their product, they had to recall millions and millions of dollars of product um, that had gone moldy, but there had been no change in their moisture content specification. Um, so great product, no problems. All of a sudden, customer complaints, product recalls. Why was this happening? Even though their moisture content specification had never changed. So our root cause analysis, why is the project be, or product being rejected? Because it's become moldy. Why is the product molding at the current moisture when no problems were had previously? Um, what we found and through investigation is they had actually changed their moisture content method from one method to another, but kept the same uh, moisture content specification. Um, and as a consequence, it wasn't, the, it wasn't resulting in the same water activity. So even though they were showing it as still 10% moisture, 
because they were using a different method, 10% moisture with one method was associated with one water activity lower than 0.7. With the other method, it was above 0.7. Why doesn't moisture content control microbial growth? Because microorganisms, uh, their, their ability to access water isn't dependent on the amount of water, it's dependent on the energy of water, as we talked about earlier. So um, why didn't they catch a change in water activity? Because they weren't actually using water activity at specification, they were using moisture content. So water activity is directly related to microbial growth based upon energy um, where the microorganisms have a internal water activity as we see here a certain internal water activity associated with them and that and they have an ideal water activity <clears throat> where their turgor pressure is optimal and their um, their uh, uh, metabolism is optimized they're doing everything they need to and under those conditions they will grow replicate um, and the they depend on their ability to be able to get water for their use for maintaining turgor pressure by having being in an environment where the water activity, the energy of the water is higher such that it will move across the membrane <clears throat> and into the organism. When they encounter environments where the water activity is lower, then water actually leaves the, the organism going from, again, high water activity to low water activity um, or high energy to low energy. Uh, in which case they lose water, their turgor pressure is gone, and they can't go through and, and do the processes they have to to replicate. <clears throat> and so by encountering low water activity, it actually stops their growth. Not because uh, water activity is, is telling what um, water is available to the organism, just simply because the energy of the water as determined by water activity is lower than the energy of the water in the inside the organism. And so when it encounters those conditions, then uh, it has to try and lower its internal water activity. And each organism has its own unique ability to lower its internal water activity. That's why they all have different cutoff levels to where growth stops. Um, and so some organisms can go to lower water activities and still replicate, whereas others cannot. Uh, and so it's this uh, reduction in energy that controls the growth of those organisms. What it doesn't do is kill them. Um, so water activity is not a kill step, it's simply a control step um, by preventing their growth. So what was the cause in this case? Um, well, they were measuring moisture content, again, with a different method. It was telling them 10%, whereas if they had measured it with their old method, they would have been getting 12%, but there was no uh, validation that was done uh, when moving to this new moisture content method. And so as a consequence, whereas 10% with the previous method uh, corresponded with the 0.69 water activity, 10%, or again, what it was actually 12% with this <clears throat> new method corresponded to a water activity of 0.78. Uh, and so it was well above the mold level. And, and so that's why they were seeing mold in all of their products. Had they been measuring water activity all along, uh, they would have, this would have never happened because they would have known that something had changed and they wouldn't have released product that was above 0.7 and they would have never had any mold uh, happen on their product. So had they been measuring water activity, it would have saved themselves millions of dollars <clears throat> in recalls um, as a consequence of, of the switch in moisture content methods. And in fact, not only would they have saved themselves, they, by using water activity, they could maximize their moisture content, which maximizes profitability. And as long as they track water activity and make sure it's less than seven, it will be safe. Um, so by switching over to a water activity specs, uh, rather than moisture content, um, they would never have, have uh, experienced the recall that they did. And going forward, they would prevent any kind of recalls from in the future. Um, and the uh, recommendation is to only use moisture content as a standard of identity and not release off of it. Um, and that they could maximize their moisture content through formulation as long as they stay below that 0.68 water activity. Um, so by doing uh, these steps, they, first of all, had they done them earlier, they could have saved themselves millions, but by doing, making sure that they move forward with them, they could regain the, con the, uh, the um, trust of their customers 
um, as well as making sure that they don't have uh, recalls in the future. So water activity really does become an incredibly important specification. Um, processing to non-ideal water activities can result in losses of revenue from waste, from under-processing, could lead to loss of shelf life. Over-processing is waste in energy that's, um, <clears throat> that's being put in, plus you're losing product by removing um, weight. Uh, so uh, as we can see in the, in the graph, if you have an ideal water activity that's at, um, say, 0.65, but you process it to 0.42 just to make sure it's safe or because you're going off of a moisture content specification that's incorrect, you're losing 5% of your product um, just by removal of moisture. And water is one of the cheapest ingredients. So maximizing your profitability really is, is dictated by using your specifications correctly and um, and that uh, what goes along with that is to use water activity um, as that specification. So by monitoring water activity during production um, and then making um, adjustments, you can assure that you're going to get the right final water activity. And then using um, uh, ideal water activity values as the specification um, for release of product max. Uh, ensures you'll maximize your product um, profitability while uh, ensuring that it's going to be safe and uh, and it's going to have the quality that's expected. And then the final piece of that is just to keep it at that water activity, and that's back to the packaging as we saw with the first case study, making sure your packaging is correct and not over packaging, which can lead to waste, which again can cost dollars that are unnecessary and and uh, eat into profits. So that's uh, the presentation for uh, water activity and how it can help with, uh, by saving um, uh, uh, producers through preventing recalls as well as by avoiding uh, waste. And uh, we now can uh, do questions.